my pleasure to introduce our first round of panelists, Kevin Cunahan and Dr. Karen Maddox, moderated by Professor Bart Hamilton. Kevin Cunahan is an accomplished executive with over 30 years experience with expertise in multidisciplinary, complex turnaround environments requiring specific leadership and organizational transformation skills. He possesses a unique mixture of senior, private, and public sector positions, reporting to and engaging with the highest levels of leadership. Kevin has held various leadership roles, including President of Choice Administrators Exchange Solutions, CEO of Healthcare.gov, CMO of Commonwealth of Massachusetts Health Insurance Connector, and Regional Vice President of Cigna. Kevin currently is Senior Vice President of Products at Centene. Dr. Karen Maddox previously served as Senior Advisor in the Office of Health Policy for the United States Department of Health and Human Services. She currently practices as a cardiologist at Barnes Jewish Hospital and is an assistant professor here at Washington University School of Medicine. She's a co-director of the Center for Health Economics and Policy at WashU's Institute for Public Health. Additionally, she's an associate editor for health policy at the Journal of American Medical Association and serves on committees relating to quality measurement and payment reform. Our moderator for this panel will be Professor Bart Hamilton. Professor Hamilton received his undergraduate degree in economics from UC Berkeley and PhD in economics from Stanford University. His areas of expertise include entrepreneurship, healthcare, economics, and strategy. Professor Hamilton is an accomplished author in these areas of expertise. He's currently the Robert Brookings Smith Distinguished Professor of Entrepreneurship and Economics and the Director of Koch Center for Family Business at WashU's Olin Business School, where he teaches at the undergraduate MBA PhD um, levels. Additionally, he has received the Reed Award for Olin Teacher of the Year twice and also the Distinguished Faculty Award. Please wel help me welcome Kevin Cunahan, Dr. Karen Maddox, and Professor Hamilton. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. And it's a real pleasure to moderate this panel on uh, Will Value Based uh, Care Save Us? Um, we're going to build on what we heard this morning from Alex Gorski and from Peter about um, different ways, kind of the, in our panel, uh, ways that public policy can influence uh, innovation through its impact on things like value-based care. Um, and I'd like to welcome my panelists here. Before we start, I, I do have to say one thing. Um, so Kevin was the CEO of Healthcare, came in to fix uh, healthcare.gov, healthcare.gov back in 2014, so he knows a lot about fixing apps. Uh, maybe he should be <laughs> heading over to Iowa um, <laughs> after this. <laughs> Might be our more high, high, high value add, um, high value add activity. Excuse so, me, Bart, I, I was just gonna, I told Bart in the green room that there's actually commonality. Neither was tested. <laughs> So I want to I want to start. Um, we're going to get into a few topics. One is um, where do we stand with value-based care? What about innovations in models of value-based care? And then we're going to talk more broadly about um, the impact of value-based care models on innovation, the kind of stuff that uh, Alex was talking about that J and J is doing. But to start with, uh, I want to ask Karen, can you just give us kind of set us up? What do we make sure everybody's on the same page? What do we mean by uh, value-based care? And what are the ingredients of a value-based care model? Sure, so we'll just sort of start with the, the most uh, common ground, I guess, for value-based care, which is essentially saying that we're gonna tie payment to quality and outcomes. So instead of just paying for what you bill, so you bill for a chest x-ray, you get paid for a chest x-ray, let's think about now tweaking those payments to be connected to either the quality or the outcomes of, of care delivered. And that can take many, many forms, and I'm sure we'll talk about the many forms that it can take. That can go from you know, adding a half a percent to a bill based on your performance on quality measures. It can go to global payment for hospitals, like Maryland is exper experimenting with. There's many, many ways that this can take form. And you can imagine we can think about value-based care not only in the care delivery piece, so not just in the sort of um, changing how we pay hospitals or clinicians, so that's the way that it's most typically used, but increasingly, we're also thinking about how value-based care can be part of pharmaceuticals and devices and a whole sort of the whole slew um, of the components that go into care delivery. We could think about paying more for hip and knee replacement based on outcomes. We could think about paying more for the components of hip and knee replacement based on outcomes. We could think about paying more for a medicine that is used after hip and knee replacement uh, that influences outcomes. So it's a term that covers 
the entirety of healthcare delivery, but talks about now not just paying for what we do, but paying for what we achieve at the end. Are there particular ingredients that, given these wide variety of plans, are there particular ingredients that are common to all of them? So I think in general, the sort of value-based care 1.0 um, started with pretty simplistic quality measures. So we will pay hospitals 1% more if they give aspirin to people having heart attacks and if they give antibiotics to people who have pneumonia. So I'd say that the initial value-based care models were all built on a fairly standard platform of these quality measures that we've been collecting since the Joint Commission started doing it in the 50s and 60s. But over the last five to 10 years maybe, I think that's really started to shift. So now the ingredients can be anything. Um, as I mentioned, if you think about the, the inputs of anything, we can think about blowing up the payment system completely. But initially, very much based on um, easy to measure sort of core quality bits, and now moving much more to what can we globally achieve for patients and how can we put some sort of value into that equation. So Kevin, given we've had some experience with um, value-based models and value-based purchasing by CMS, federal government, and so forth, mm -hmm. how do you assess kind of the success or failure of these kinds of, the, at least the federal government's uh, roll out of these kinds of models thus far in terms of cost control as well as um, patient health? So I think it's, frankly, I th you may be referring to macro in part mm -hmm. with that question, and I personally think it's a little bit too early to say. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in our, in our country, this concept of value-based purchasing, whether it has to do with contracting or performance, as Karen very well articulated, is actually fairly new. And, um, you know, when you hear that you have to incent a hospital to make sure that aspirin is given, you know, given that we've got, you know, we're approaching 19% of GDP for healthcare, that's a little, you know, unfortunate. Um, so, you know, that, that's a different issue, I know. But that seems a little odd. But I think one of the, one of the things, to a point that Karen made, and I certainly found this in, in government, and Karen and I actually overlapped in the administration, um, is uh, they tend to make things too complicated. And, you know, at least in my own experience, value-based contracting, whether it's with hospitals or now talking about pharmacy, which is a very, very interesting area of VBC. It has to do a lot with simplicity and less is more. And I just find in general, the government is particularly brilliant at overcomplicating things, which makes things hard to understand, hard to administer, hard to communicate, and thus more challenging to be successful. What do you, this is interesting. I, what do you think, so you, Karen kind of mentioned value-based care 1.0, we've kind of done that. Now we're doing, um, we're kind of, I guess, at 2.0 and, and beyond. Um, and you, you briefly mentioned about a particular state. And one thing I want to ask both of you is, um, we see a lot of experimentation and so forth that different states, Centene, of course, is operating in many different, many different states and has that experience. So the federal government maybe is a bit too early, but how have you seen innovation in these value-based care models across um, different states? Um, we'll talk first about kind of what, what might be pushed by public policy, and then maybe we can talk a little bit about commercial payers. So I think on the state level, it's fairly um, spotty. Um, so there, there's, there's, um, it's very complicated for a state to to be particularly innovative because there are so many constituencies that impact policy in a state. So you've, you can have the medical society, the hospital association, you've got all these special interest groups that are impacting policy and RFPs. Now, one state I think in particular that's been, I think, particularly innovative in this regard has been North Carolina. And North Carolina has done a lot early on, and I think it's with the direction of the Secretary of Health and Human Services, who you know, I used to work with. Um, who is a physician and is very sophisticated, Mandy Cohen. And um, she's worked, I think, brilliantly with developing an RFP that actually promotes quality and value in some interesting ways, given the dynamics of the state. Well, can, you, can you say a little bit more about the specifics of what she's doing and, or what? Well, you know, it's, 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 it's complicated, but I mean, in part around the value base has to do with incentives. It has to do with things like what Massachusetts has done, in part in the Medicaid program, which is to link in social determinants with, with payment. So a lot of it has to do with trying to create value with, in the context of social determinants. 
Ken, what, what do you see with, um, or let me ask you about what you see on different kind of state initiatives, uh, what you think has worked, and maybe some that you don't think are working too well. Hmm, that's a good question. So uh, I think we've seen the beginnings of experimentation. Um, Maryland, for example, has moved to global budgeting for hospitals. Um, North Carolina has moved to trying to do basically a multi-stakeholder coordinated value-based approach. Um, Massachusetts has been, uh, just because of the way that they got everyone to coverage early, they were able to do more around sort of the accountable care organization move in Massachusetts, both through uh, public and private payers. Um, and I think all of those places have seen some success. Um, I, I do agree that the common element for success is simplification and uh, whatever the word would be for getting people on the same page. Mm -hmm. So right now, if you're thinking about value-based payment, you have a different way to measure infections from Blue Cross and from Aetna and from CMS and from Medicaid. And you have a different way to measure your sepsis bundle based on who put it in and when it happened. And you have a different way to um, manually extract from the medical record, buildings of people doing manual extraction to get just these minute details about quality, which we should be delivering anyways, um, yet somehow we haven't been able to sort of back up and say, how are we actually going to make health better? And that piece is where I think an approach like Maryland or like North Carolina, where you get people at the table having these more strategic um, discussions, is likely to lead to more change. Ideally, what policymakers do is kind of set the rules, right? So um, where you set those rules will depend where, or will, um, will influence where people go. What you want to do is set rules that push people in the right direction and then get out of the way and let them figure out how to innovate. Let them figure out how to change care. Let them figure out how to do things better. But set very clear expectations of what's going to happen. Every person in this country that shows up with symptoms of a stroke to an emergency department should get the appropriate care. Doesn't matter where you go, we as a whatever billion dollar, trillion dollar industry need to be able to deliver that care. You shouldn't get paid if you can't do that. However, how you get there, I don't know. You know, talk to the people in this room about how to make that happen. So I think the fact is when, when states and when the federal government can get simple and very clear, and then let people innovate on how to do it is when we're more likely to have successful policies. You know, if I could just follow yeah. up on that, just a couple of things that Karen uh, uh, triggered. One is that sense of consistency, because when you speak to providers, one of the things that just drives them bonkers is, is the point that Karen made, which is that the issuers have these different kind of measures, and the government has a different kind of measure. That it, it really, it's not really helping anybody, it's complicating things, and it's really getting in the way of, of success. So I think that that's an important point. A second point, at least for me, and I'd be interested to see what the rest of uh, Karen and Bart have to say, is I think having these, these incentives and disincentives have to be in place. So just being upside, I'm not sure is always as helpful as having some risk as well. Because there's a lot of examples, whether it's through capitation or other types of risk arrangements, where providers do respond to both upside and downside. So I, I, you know, I think that element, which is also built into MACRA, um, is, is critical. What do you think about having, the, having both upside and downside risk? I mean, this has been very, uh, I think, point of contention in these kinds yeah. of models. And obviously, a lot of people don't like downside risk. Yeah, it's been, I think it's been one of the things that has limited the move toward value-based care, frankly, is because we've made a lot of it pretty optional. And if you make it optional, it's very difficult for leaders to predict where the puck is going to be. And if you say, we could go this way or we might go this way, and it depends on how many people mm -hmm. join, that's not great for strategic planning. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think the intent of voluntary programs and only upside risk is obviously to get people in. Mm -hmm. And then the goal was to start sort of ratcheting down. The ratcheting just didn't happen. Um, it, failing to set clear rules and clear expectations, I think actually doesn't do a service to the, the sort of innovation community and the delivery community in terms of letting them figure out how to, mm -hmm. how to excel at something. Risk bearing is tricky because you, if you, you need to put risk where it can be borne, right? Yeah. So if you put risk where it can't be borne, people will do the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. If you put, uh, you can look at like VA wait times or um, I'm sure there are other examples where if you put risk in place where people can't actually control the ability to meet that, people are just going to act badly. That's a setup for disaster. 
if you put risk where it can be borne at an incense the right thing, then yes, downside risk is, is tremendously important. Finding the right balance for a small independent practice in a rural area versus a big hospital system, one size does not fit all. That's right. And so that, I think, has been a little bit of the trouble with MACRA, this sort of we're going to push one program out and it's going to do everything. That, well, that doesn't make sense. That's true. But as you also know, in part of what MACRA was intending to do, and, and your, your point about rural is absolutely spot on, but it was intended in part to take those small practices and actually get them to consolidate. Yeah, totally. Yeah, and, and, and uh, that's, the jury's still out on that, but that was the intent. What do you, so one thing we were talking about in the green room just before we came out that I hadn't really been thinking enough about is, um, so we've been, in value-based care models, we're, I'm an economist, so we, economists always think about demand and supply. And we think about value-based care, we're really talking about supply. How do we provide incentives to um, you know, different players on the supply side, providers and so forth, to provide care in an efficient way. But where does demand come in? I mean, in terms of patients. So how we heard from Alex in his talk that 75% of health problems that you have later in life are because of behaviors you have early in life. Um, so how is value-based care going to solve that problem? And can it solve that problem of behavior? Do these kinds of models provide incentives to solve those behaviors Kind of just get your reaction to uh, this, what, what something that really struck me from the morning session. So, that, <laughs> see, so, this, so Karen understands what a complicated question that was. Yeah. So she, she, she kicked it over. So I'm, I was looking. Sorry. I was looking. I was looking back at her. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so the short answer on that is no. And in my opinion, and uh, but but that is a that is a part that I think is a very important thing that you're raising, and. You know, when you look at the ACA, for example, there was this kind of, I don't know, semi-gratuitous attempt to try to build some behavior change in place by allowing issuers to charge differentially for people who smoked. So if you, if, so in, in fact, you could charge a higher premium for people that smoked. This idea about personal behavior and, and accountability um, is, is, I think, is worthy of another session. But I personally think this is actually a very critical topic because, um, you know, I travel a fair amount, and you know, I'll be very frank with you. Um, it seems to me, and this is this is just a, an end of one, right? This is just me traveling around the country. I see more people waiting to get wheelchairs now than I did a few years ago, and it wasn't that long ago. I don't mean like 20 years ago. I mean like three or four years ago. And I'm just I look at the population sometimes, and I'm not holding myself up as a uh, paradigm of good health. But I look at sometimes around the country, I go, geez, you know, is this the, what the next 20 years is going to look like? So I feel like, you know, <laughs> maybe there should be something in the way insurance gets priced, subsidies are created, you know, something that takes this into, into account. I, I don't, certainly don't have the answer for it, but I think it's an important question. So I will take this slightly opposite oh, approach, good. which is to say that I completely agree that the health of the nation, not to get too sort of grandiose about this, but is a public good. It's just, it's a public good. It's, we all benefit from it, right? We, we will pay less in the long run if people are healthy. We don't treat it like a public good. We mm -hmm. treat it like an individual failure, mm -hmm. and in some cases it is, but if we don't think about health as a pretty, in a pretty different paradigm, we're never going to invest in the kind of things that are going to change health. Because many individuals can't change their own health, and if you talk to someone who is faced every social determinant in the book mm -hmm. and the stress and discrimination and mm -hmm. all the things that happen, like that isn't gonna change unless we have a collective approach to changing it. I don't think there's a place in the payer side where there's enough continuity and enough long range thinking to fundamentally change that right. with the possible exception of Medicare if Medicare could think that far in advance, right? right? And I don't know exactly how to sort of square that circle, but that seems to me to be a major challenge. We could use value to do that, but you'd have to think very differently about this as a collective public good, I think. So, so Karen, if I could I'll just respond, I, I completely agree with what you're saying. I, I, guess, I, I guess it just feels to me that there, there will always going to be some very legitimate issues. You mentioned social determinants, which is a very, very important point uh, of while this is not gonna be fair. But I just feel like what we're doing right now, where we're kicking the can down the road on this stuff all, every single year, is not helping us either. Yeah. 
And, and I just feel we ha when you talk about changing the paradigm, we also have to change the consciousness of people's sense that I've got some personal responsibility over my health. Now, I'm not at all disagreeing with your point about influences and about things what people can't control. I agree that. But, you know, it, it's a little bit like letting perfection be a victim of the good. I feel like we have to do something where people feel like there's some consequence to this behavior or otherwise, I'm just wondering if we don't just perpetuate. Totally. And, and to be fair, I took the opposite side to take the opposite side to some degree. And, and as with most things in this world, that the, the combination of both sides of this is what we need to do. Right. 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 It, individual right. isn't going to work by itself and public isn't going to work by itself. That's right. And both of these things actually have to be done. And we're in this sort of strange political time, too, where we manage right. to sort of pick off things that we want to do based on what your worldview is when both are actually at the same time completely true. So, so it's interesting. I'd like your opinion on the thought. I'm sorry, Bart. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've enjoyed the conversation. <laughs> I'm not trying to hijack the thing. You know, the administration's proposing a variety of different interesting actions. So interoperability rules, the transparency rules, I'd be interested in your reaction. So I and and, and I'm not representing. So I know I'm representing, but this is just representing my my um, own individual perspective. Having been in, in this insurance business for a very long time, I'm personally um, somewhat concerned that the idea of making costs and prices transparent, which theoretically is great, right, is bringing consumerism into into the field, which we could debate whether healthcare actually is a good subject for consumerism, but it actually could have an opposite effect because if it's not being accompanied with quality metrics and you're just being shown price, does A, that not take more efficient providers and actually encourage them to raise their prices? Right. And B is, does it perhaps confuse a consumer thinking that quality is related to price so I should go to a higher cost facility since they cost more? Uh, yes, those are all good questions. Let me think for a moment. So healthcare is not a functional market. Right, it's, it's just not. And the, the people who are supposed to be acting as the market players on behalf of the patients are the insurance companies. So they're, in theory, supposed to be our agents in negotiating with a hospital or a, or a clinician to then get us the market-based best deal they can get. Right. And part of that agency is because they have the power to do so. I can't individually go to Barnes and tell them I'd like to pay less for my knee replacement. I could, but they'd come after me with a collection agency, <laughs> I'm sure. Um, and part of that agency is because the information asymmetry is so shocking in healthcare that you need people with some sort of um, knowledge in, in a topic to be able to effectively parse cost and quality. And they aren't an equal trade-off, but they're not unrelated. Mm -hmm. um, I think there has been some concern that transparency will um, will push prices up because it would allow payers and insure and providers to know what the others are charging. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know that transparency will necessarily bring prices down. I do think that if we want to have a conversation around pricing and around the sort of runaway prices, seeing them as a good start. But I agree that it's not going to work like a typical market. Particularly if there's not quality related to right. it. And we can and this is something else that I feel like if folks in this room could help influence the fact that we don't, can't agree on substantive quality metrics in 2020 in something that's almost 20% of the U.S. economy is really kind of disgraceful. I mean, this has been, and something else has been kicked down the, the, this can's been kicked down the road for 30 years. Everybody's patients are, are always uniquely sick. Nobody can agree. It's statistically invalid. Really? I just don't believe that. I just believe there's enough evidence-based care and enough uh, metrics that PhDs and all the brilliant people in this audience right now can figure out metrics that may not be perfect, but might be good enough for the average consumer to actually make decisions based on. And I, I just feel that this is something else. Maybe it's like having to been sent to a hospital to give aspirin, but good, good, goodness, we ought to be able to have quality <laughs> I, by now. Can I ask, uh, so I'm getting the high sign. We want to make sure we have enough time for questions, and I want to make sure we get to talk a little bit about the impact of these value-based models for innovation. You kind of raise things about quality measures and financial measures. And one thing that we know from talking to outside of healthcare, privately held companies versus public companies is the focus on public companies of quarterly earnings and so forth often drives very short-term thinking in terms of R&D. And I guess 
One thing, uh, are you concerned that a lot of the value-based quality and financial measures are shorter term? You, know, you mentioned a year, or a quarter, 90-day readmission. Are you concerned that that'll inhibit innovation or kind of innovative activity or the adoption, I should say, the adoption of innovations when maybe value-based care will focus people more on the short term rather than, rather than the longer term? So I think it's actually the opposite. I actually I think that <laughs> uh, it actually incents creativity mm -hmm. and, and innovation in order to be successful. So I think these programs actually encourage it. And, um, and I think that's one of the reasons that they're important. Is it, is it a, I can't remember the name of this topic, but is it like the cure for, is it, this, is it gonna save us? Yeah, no. well, value yeah. Cure, <laughs> save us. No, it's not gonna save. You, not really, gonna, you really responded. Uh, <laughs> that really, I, I'm sorry. Kevin I, didn't like the title. Well, I, you know, I just, you know, I, it's, it's, saving us is a broad term, yeah. but um, it's a piece of it. Uh, it's a start, we've seen it work in Southern California, we've seen it work in parts of Florida, we've seen, but, but I think, you know, to a point that Karen had raised, there's not just a one size fits all approach. And I think one of the things that we've learned is the complexity of our country, and we have to recognize that different approaches will work regionally. So for example, something that works in Maryland may not work in Alabama, mm -hmm. but something that works in Southern California may work somewhere else. But that's why healthcare is so local. And it's one of the reasons that it's both important that way, but also it's, it's complicated that way. I think linking maybe to, the, to both the prior conversation and the next panel, there's a, um, there's a role for value-based care to facilitate the kind of innovation that people want to be doing mm -hmm. that is mm -hmm. ultimately focused on the longer term. You right. just have to set up the rules that way. Right. Um, mm -hmm. if, you know, if, if you build it, they will come. What it, mm -hmm. if, if you put money out there, people will go get it. Right. You just have to put money in the right place. The right you know, right. If you're going to yeah. teach, everyone teaches to the test, yeah. we'll make a good test. Yeah. If we get the rules such that you're incented to take ownership of a patient yeah. for a year or some sort of collective responsibility, yeah. people will absolutely go in that direction. I mean, if you look at value-based contracting for a provider, let's just say, uh, it's, it's really based on a few key principles. So one is it's got to be simple to understand and also it has to be fair. It has to be reasonable. It has to be things that can be controllable. Two is you need to have actionable information. Uh, so because if you just overload providers, which is so typical for carriers to do, um, they, it, it doesn't really help them uh, it, administer. It's almost like if I give you more stuff, then there's no excuse for you not being able to do it. it the, the providers and the, and the carriers really have to agree on what's actionable. And then the third is, in, in my opinion, is, is having the, the upside and the downside. There's got to be some skin in the game both ways. So the function of policy here, I, I think the clear message from both of you is setting these rules of the game very clearly so yep. innovators can respond to yep. them and right. come up with new solutions to, to kind of the healthcare problems mm -hmm. that we have. Yep. Last question then uh, for me and then we'll, um, so 20 years ago if we had our healthcare symposium minus 0.2, it would have been all about will managed care save us? 10 years ago it would be will consumer driven health plans save us? Now it's will value-based healthcare save us. 10 years from now in our healthcare symposium 12.0, are we gonna say, hey, value-based care saved us? Or <laughs> are we still gonna be debating this uh, with the new, whatever the new thing is? Just <laughs> quick reaction. I mean, I, I hope we're not gonna be having the same <laughs> conversation in 10 years and looking for the next thing. You know, we, we do kind of have a tendency to relabel, right? So um, capitation is now global budgeting. Right. And, you know, there's Pay for performance is now value-based payment. It's right. the same stuff That's over right. and over again. That's right. um, so I don't think it would be fair to say that we, we, we'll we just rebrand it as something right. else. We'll have a conversation with something else save us. But I guess I do think that maybe because of the data availability now mm -hmm. and the speed at which things are happening and the diversity of opinions that are being brought into how this can be done and that, you know, in, in all the ways that that means, I hope that we're at a really different paradigm 10 years from now. We deliver care fundamentally the same way as we did 50 years ago, right? People like show up to an office and you, it, it, it doesn't have to be that way. Mm -hmm. and, and somewhere we are, po we are poised to have a real break in what this looks like. I don't know if that's gonna be in the next 10 years. I certainly hope it is. And I hope people in this room are gonna help us get there. It won't happen unless we're sort of bold enough to change the rules, put risk on the table and fundamentally let things shake a little bit I hope, we, I hope we can do that before 12.0. <laughs> Kevin? So I think one thing that's going to really impact this is technology. And I'll just give you this, just a very small, you know, 
basic example of that. So telehealth providers are moving into uh, using AI uh, uh, at a fairly rapid pace. And the logic is that taking evidence-based care um, uh, uh, knowledge and building these information data warehouses will at some point uh, be able to allow patients to be able to type in a, a, a symptom, you know, differently than a WebMD, but, but actually get more of a substantive response with respect to what those symptoms may dictate. Uh, get on their phone, uh, uh, speak to a physician, which is going to get to access issues, and, and then be able to determine uh, in part where the appropriate treatment needs to be. Now, I don't at all say this is a panacea. I don't at all say that this is going to save us. But I think it's a key part of getting to such issues as access to rural and also to different generations. For example, so I don't know if this is really representative. We have a 32-year-old daughter who, frankly, couldn't care less about seeing a doctor and having a personal physician or going to a brick-and-mortar facility. You know, if she's sick, she goes on telehealth. If she's near an urgent care facility in New York City, she, that's where she goes. Her friends do the same thing. I guess my point is, I think under, people under 40, I don't know if that's the right cutoff point or not, are looking at this world more in a transactional way. And I suspect that that's going to be a big part of the future. And it's going to be up to folks both in academia and providers and payers and such to figure out how best to, to, to meet the needs of that population, because they're going to deal with the world differently. I mean, that's really interesting, because we often think continuity of care is a very important thing. You're saying, actually, those are people who may not want continuity of care with the same just the I sequence just, of transactions. I, and I, I, again, I don't know if this is a fair, yeah. uh, but the research is sort of bearing this out. You know, texting versus phone calls. You know, my generation, you know, that just seems so impersonal. You know, her response to things is that's so inefficient. Why would you waste your time making a phone call? So I just, I just think that that mindset is going to be very, very different, and the healthcare industry and healthcare industrial complex is going to have to accommodate it. Well, I think I want to make sure we have some uh, time for questions from you. Um, I think you've seated both of you have seated a lot of interesting ideas. Could spend a lot of much more time talking about these. So who has questions? Um, I'll wait for the mic. Do you think there's any correlation between the degradation of provider pay and value-based um, health care? I didn't know provider payment was degradating. You know? I, I mean, as value-based care is currently done, it's fairly minimal. So the value-based care itself, you know, the hospital readmissions reduction program, the hospital VBP, sort of a percent or two here or there. And so those are a big deal and on any given margins being what they are in some, some hospitals in some areas that can be a big deal. I don't think actually value-based care has been strong enough to have driven bigger trends like that right. personally. That's right. That's true. Hi. So um, we've talked about where patients and providers and insurance plans fit in. Does the panel have a, an opinion on where industry fits into the equation? In, in terms of driving down cost yeah. and uh, increasing value of care. I think industry is likely to have some of the more creative solutions to this stuff, given yeah, that a lot of us are stuck in our, our provider paradigm. Right. And when you say <laughs> industry, you're talking about businesses, so how employers? So pharma. Oh. Yeah, pharma. Okay, so, so, so here's, yeah. all right, so that's an interesting question. So let me just give you an example. So we're talking with a, a firm right now um, in Boston who, um, has been work, working with uh, uh, the Human Genome Project for about 20 years. And they have made a statement. These are very substantive people. So for example, one of the co-founders is um, a head of general medicine at the Brigham and uh, also on the faculty uh, senior guy at Harvard Medical. And they, they believe that the top 10 consumer, direct-to-consumer drugs actually don't metabolize in uh, almost 90% of patients. And if you take the number one consumer drug, which is Humira, um, their research is showing that, in fact, that doesn't metabolize in 65% of people that take it. So one of the things that we're looking at, we don't know if that's true or not, but one of the things that we're looking at very carefully with them is to see, in fact, whether or not their, their data is right. Because I can just tell you, just on the drug side alone, uh, the costs are just exploding. And there are something like 20 to 25 new gene and cell therapies that are going to be introduced over the next 18 months that at minimum have six-figure price tags and some much, much more than that. So we're talking to another firm about how to get better research into whether those are going to work or not. 
My point in all this, because you were talking about pharma, is I believe more in the future that, that firms like my own are going to have to get closer to pharma in terms of getting in with early research, understanding what's going to be effective, what's more efficient, because right now, the way things are working and the way the FDA approval process is working and the way Medicaid rules work right now, this is a cost explosion that um, is really a, a, a really potential risk. And to, to sort of piggyback on that and then bring in state innovation and value-based care, if you think about something like the hepatitis C drugs, right? Those are curative. And some of these mm -hmm. gene and cell-based therapies are curative. We don't have a payment model for curative therapy. That's right. right. It just doesn't, how do you right. amortize over someone's lifetime right. the effect of a cure for a disease? Okay. And because of the churn between different payers and because of Medicaid budgets and states having to remain within budget in a year, they can't borrow like the federal government can, they can't do that. And so we don't actually have a payment model where we can find those truly innovative high value but extraordinarily expensive items. And that's a place where without close input with industry as well as payers and the, the, the regulatory side, be that state or federal, we're never gonna get where we need to go with some of these emerging therapies. I, I completely agree. And just to give you an example how Medicaid works. So if an FDA, the FDA approves a drug, Medicaid has to cover it. So um, some of the states, um, as you know, the way Medicare is financed, some of the states are really grappling with actually putting limits on access to some of these very expensive drugs. And if the block grant proposal goes through, that actually would even accelerate that. So th this is a very complex issue we have to deal with. Well, I think that's <laughs> what you just both said is really powerful. We don't have a payment model for curative therapies, mm -hmm. which says who's going to innovate mm -hmm. uh, in curative therapies if you're not going to get paid for it. It's, right. Yeah, that's very, very sharp. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that uh, what, what you're saying is also very true. But when we think about these expensive therapeutics, has anybody really looked to compare those, what it's costing the healthcare industry to keep these people going on a non proven therapeutic or just a palliative, you know, method? So, you know, we have a lot of that. We have a lot of you know, childhood illnesses that are chronic. And so what is that costing the health industry versus putting them on a $500,000 drug that maybe could yep. cure them? So, you know, we have to weigh that too. Yep. I, th I, think that was, I think that was Karen's point, actually. It's never been a yeah. conversation before because those things haven't yeah. existed. Yeah, think right. about something like sickle cell or that's CF. Right. I mean, these are kids who are going to be facing a lifetime, and increasingly a longer and longer lifetime, of incredible medical expenses. We, we don't have any, we, we have never had the opportunity before to fundamentally change that paradigm. And now that we do, we don't have the regulatory infrastructure or the money, frankly, to that's figure right. out how we're going to do it. That's right. So in many cases, it will be ultimately cheaper to cure the disease. And that's so Louisiana. I meant to talk about a state. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Louisiana, yeah. for example, essentially went to like a, you probably understand this better than I do, yeah. but essentially a guaranteed volume contract right. to get their hep C drugs. That's so right. they essentially said, we're going to guarantee you, we're just going to give you a lump sum. You let us use as much as we can use. Right. We're going to get as many people cured as we can. Yeah. in this time frame. But and that was a pretty creative way to do it. I, I completely agree. But just to take this just to just a slightly different point, if the block grant proposal goes through, yes. that's going to change all of that. Yeah. Or could, I should say. Question yeah. there and then a question over there. So if you want to make regionally appropriate value-based care initiatives, how do you ensure equity and care quality and principles across state and regional lines? Yeah. That's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> Want to, even, disparities, <laughs> want to get to the disparities question. We can barely make yeah. it work at a hospital. A little. Yeah. Um, I, 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 don't know the, I don't know the answer to that. You know, that's, that's, a, that's a very good question. It's a very complicated question. And I mean, just speaking from a payer perspective, I, I think that that kind of question is actually a bit futuristic. We, we've got a lot of fundamentals that we need to do right now. Your point, though, is a very, very good one. And that really gets to saying more in the future, how do you make these things work? and make them more substantively work. It feels to me that one way to do this is to make them simpler, to make them easier for providers to understand, give providers the right information to make them work. Don't try to boil the ocean. Let's just try to work on the, in the lake first. 
and then learn from that, the lake and then just bring it upstream. There's also an issue, I think, of pretty different regional approaches to investing in health in general. And I think it's always a tension of what do you leave to state's discretion? What do you leave to city's discretion? What do you leave to local discretion? And what do you say as a federal government, we are gonna sort of set some sort of standard? You see this play out in education, you see mm -hmm. it play out in healthcare. It's really tricky to get that balance right. I do think that some simple, clear leadership from Medicare being the sort of dominant place where oftentimes people follow where, it, where people follow where they go because of just the volume issue is one way to set some norms and then let people sort of work around that. But I'm not sure we're ever gonna make localities value the same things. I, I guess one point to your point on Medicare is that perhaps the changing demographics are gonna force the issue more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's roughly 10,000 people a day turning 65. It's a massive generational change, obviously. That's gonna put a tremendous strain on the budget and it may just do what government is often forced to do, which it doesn't really make change until it's got a gun to its head. Yeah. At, at some point, Medicare's got, I don't know, I get in trouble for saying these things. I think at some point, Medicare's gonna have to think about spending caps in a different way than they do now. Like it's the, the demography of how we think about right. these things is That's gonna right. change That's so fundamentally right. that our current approach, you know, SGR or whatever right. approach you wanna take doesn't, right. doesn't work anymore. Right. Right. I don't know exactly what right. the right thing is to do there, but it right. will change when there's a lot more people all I of agree. a sudden. Let me get, we have a question over there and then I had a question there. So uh, what do you guys think we can learn from our peer nations who, you know, according to most reports, tend to have better health care than we do um, in terms of, you know, innovation and advancing our payment, but also care system? Because it's, a lot of times it feels like we're trying to reinvent the wheel of sorts. What What kind of things are coming up or are currently working well that you think would mesh well with our system? We talked a little bit about this before. So one thing that other countries do better than we do is access. And so you can, you can look at Germany and Switzerland and Singapore and plenty of other places that do the UK that go pretty much from completely like government run medicine to government funded but completely privately administered medicine. Mm -hmm. And in all those places, it, it requires a different solution to, to drive innovation. But a commonality is getting everyone into the system early and having a long-term um, view on how we're gonna care for people. We don't have that because of the employer-sponsored insurance accident, right? I mean, we, no one would set this up on purpose this way now. We're just stuck with it because it's how it happened in the political climate around the war. Right, that's right. That we have these chunks of populations as opposed to having people and families and lifespan together. So I think if we can solve the access problem and, and sort of build the continuity or some sort of collective action around continuity, we, would, we could take some of the positive things that other countries have done and then put our American innovative, privately driven stamp on it. I think that's fine. Other countries do that too. I think, I think personally our access problem is the sort of most shameful and also probably the most powerful in terms of health. I, I completely agree with that. I, I do think that in some ways it's hard to divorce some of this ironically from our political contribution system. So for example, there are roughly 635 registered farmer reps in DC. There are 535 members of Congress. There's more than one uh, lobbyist for each member of Congress that also give a lot of money to campaigns. And so it just perpetuates a system that I think all of us or each of us would acknowledge could be made better. Let me, we have time for one more short question, I think. So within the context of value-based, we are talking about going from transactional through this transitory phase and then ultimately tra transformational. <laughs> And I believe the dynamics of the transitional phase where we are talking about upside gain share, downside risk models are also inherently transactional still. You're still operating on the fee-for-service basis. And then we have this utmost extreme end of uh, transformation, which is the global capitation. Mm -hmm. And we have some you know, primary clinics or hospitals who are now starting to operate on that type of model. Mm -hmm. Within the context of value-based, if you're talking about a paradigm shift, um, do you think it's more plausible to establish a whole new paradigm operating on the global capitation model? Or do you think there's a still opportunity to really help the existing providers transition through this phase and get to that level? Which one do you think would be 
ultimately more successful in terms of moving towards value-based? Hmm. That's a question for the business organizational people in this room. From a policy standpoint, it's, I think, much more likely that we'll go through a slow and painful process um, because that's how policy (laughs) works. Um, I do think that there are likely there's likely always going to be a need for old traditional payment. And actually, to get back to a point that you made earlier, for old traditional doctoring and nursing, global capitation and a lot of things like that work great for population health. They don't work very well for acute, life-threatening illness. Um, Telemedicine works really well for general population health. It does not work very well to sit down and talk to someone about your new diagnosis of lymphoma. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. we'll be stuck in a mix forever. And we should be stuck in a mix forever because it is a complicated thing. We don't need doctors for a lot of what we deliver healthcare as now. This turf battle between doctors and other clinicians is absurd. Um, We need to rethink how all that goes. From a policy standpoint, I suspect it will be gradual. Yeah, I I agree with that. I think it's a, I think that's it's, it's the right question. I, there, there's a side of me that thinks that that there that, that there there's going to be some some highly innovative model that's going to come out that is is going to be something that we may not be thinking about. It's going to be it's just going to be uh, I can't I can't really explain what this is going to look like. I, I can't figure it out. But there, my, I think that the crisis we've got in terms of cost, quality, and access, which is this sort of three-legged stool we've got to figure out. Is is going to drive some some significant innovation that's actually going to be transformational. When you've done this as long as some of us have been, you almost get a little bit cynical about that, right? You think that this is always going to be transitional. It's just the inherent nature of what it is. It's going to be slow. It's going to be rocky. It keeps getting get more and more expensive. That we just perpetuate the same. My gut tells me though that there's going to be something new. There's something's going to break through this very differently, and um, I don't know that it will save us. But it will be a new model. I guess the interesting follow-on question to that is, do you think that'll come from a policy change, or do you think it'll come from a either a pharma or a clinical or some sort of disruptive innovation on the ground? And I think it's going to be disruptive up. from the ground. I don't think, I think it's going to be policy at all. I think policy will actually get in the way. I want to thank our. That's a great transition <laughs> to the next panel. We're going to have a time. Thank you both very much. Very informative. We're going to take just a quick five-minute change here, so stay in your seats, and uh, thank you guys very much.